We're here at uh, Forecast 2012. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com for SiliconAngle.tv Cube Conversations, and we're here with Petri Julius from Capgemini. He's the CEO of Finland, and also you're, you're in charge of the global uh, data center operation uh, for Capgemini's roadmap. Um, welcome to Cube Conversations. Thank you. Um, we have a publication called Services Angle, and we were the, really the first ones to document this migration of cloud, big data, uh, and the, the impact to services. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of thought leaders on earlier this morning here at the Intel Forecast event talking about not the argument about cloud technologies, because the data centers are these big, your big customers and the big buyers yes. uh, have been doing data server consolidation, service standardization, virtualization, I agree. You know, NAS, storage service, now mm -hmm. network virtualization mm -hmm. for years. So their mm -hmm. timeline is they're, they're cloud ready almost, but they don't really, aren't being disrupted by clouds per se, from a technology perspective, but it's really the business model yes. that's changing. So could you share with our audience um, the impact to what cloud does to the services business. When I say services, I mean there's a lot of consulting opportunity out there, but also people are selling services over the network. So yeah. their products are services. So can you talk about the landscape? Well, I think the first thing maybe is really, it is the big change. Well, there is, first of all, the business, the whole market is changing because there is a lot of new kids on the block. So there are companies that have we haven't faced. We Typically our competition or our colleagues, they are HPs, IBMs, Accenture's of the world. Now you have all the telcos, all the small companies, all, all, all kind of a, a man and a caras or man and a dog or however you say it in English <laughs> kind of a companies. So we, it's important for us that we can pick our play better so that we, we go for what kind of a services we want to go for. So we, for example, uh, we are a service, service provider basically. So the big change is, is, as you said, it is in the business model. Because to me, the, the technology, it's, it's kind of an evolutionary. So there has been changing the technology. But they would have been changing in the hypervisor, in the, in the storage, in the, in, the, in the compute level, regardless of the cloud, so-called. So then the cloud is basically the provisioning layer, kind of upwards, you could say where you can be agile, where you can you know, scale up and down easily. And then that is also then the challenge or, or the thing that we are facing now as a service provider, but also our clients is that traditionally what you try to do, of course, is you try to sell as much as possible. I mean, for most businesses, it's kind of a good thing to do, sell as much as possible. And then typically the service providers, we've been lo looking for long contracts, be it three years, five years, whatever. And now when we go to cloud, then how do we adapt because the contract can be for one day, two weeks, maybe three weeks. So it's, it's, we, we, we don't have the same kind of a client lock-in as we used to have. People talk about technology lock-in, but we talk about really the, the kind of a client lock-in as well. Well, you guys enjoyed, or Capgemini and your peers, our competition, have enjoyed a good run of lock-in over the years with SAP I deployments. Agree. I agree. Um, but, but those deployments from start to finish were pretty long. So. Um, with cloud and, and some of these new acceleration technologies, the deployment cycles are smaller because the speed True. is faster. Could you comment True. on the changes going on in that area? Well, I, I think there we are still in the, we talk about fast deployment. And I, I would like to say that yes, now everything you, you can do with the cloud, you can jump into the cloud fast and so on, but, but, but we all know that we are not there quite yet. I mean, the, we don't have the same terminology. It's not standardized totally. We are not using the same, well, abbreviation. You know, IT world is full of different kind of an abbreviation, yeah, acronyms. Uh, acronyms and all, all that kind of stuff. So we, we, we don't have a common language yet. And that's actually what is slowing down, for example, still the, the, the uh, transition and, and, the, and the changes as well. So but it, it's also what I said earlier. I think that also from, it's not only for service provider point of view, it's also for the, the clients who are looking for a cloud service, what, what they also used to do is that they were good in building a business case that do I outsource, do I keep it inside, do I insource, do I, do I buy whatever, but also for them making a business case for cloud is much more difficult than making a business case for traditional IT spend. Yeah, they're comfortable with on-premise, um, but you know, cloud offers some advantages. You mentioned spin up, spin down, on demand, buy the drink, however, renting, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Uh, but, but the complexity with things like big data, for example, you just can't spin down data. So like, it, you know, people think of uh, Amazon, for example, develop, oh, I'll just put my credit card down, I'll spin up some web servers and spin up some resources, and when I'm done, I'll just tear it down and I'll just move my app and 
and port it inside. Um, well, that's assuming you're throwing away your data. So what's become pretty clear from us, or very clear from us, is that the role of data into the business model is critical. Now that wasn't on the cloud agenda three years ago. So as a provider, how are you dealing with that? And you know, you can, you can spin up stuff in the cloud, maybe seasonality if you're in retail, or if it's something else, whatever the vertical application is, you can use the cloud for that bursting, if you will. But now you get the data, where do you put the data? Do you spin down the data? Do you port the data? So data's become an interesting linchpin now. Can you talk about the changes that you've seen with data? Well, I think the main thing is, of course, that the growth of, I mean, the, the amount of data keeps on growing all the time. So, uh, and then, if we were not so good in using the data for our business purposes three years ago, five years ago, we are not better today, but the amount of data we have is, is like multiplied, 10 or 100 or whatever. You can capture but the data, you yes. can store the data. Yeah, exactly, but what do you do with the data? So I, I think it really then, maybe that connects to the cloud as well, but I, I think it, the cloud has kind of <coughs> come afterwards, but the, the thinking of, about the BI, the analytics, all that part, we need more and more, I mean, more improved analytics and, and, and BI kind of a software, for example, or applications where we can easily, easily, uh, what you call it, the, uh, you know, crunch and blah, 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 slice and dice and, and all yeah. that, the data, and really get the information you need. Because the um, data is data, but Maybe. making it information is the most difficult so let's talk part. about let's talk about uh, some uh, successful companies in Germany, SAP. Um, headquartered in Palo Alto, yeah, heard about my it, yes. town. You've heard of those guys. They do very successful with their with their messaging and their product lines these days. They they have the HANA, they have the in-memory, um, they have the application suites. They talk about business analytics. It's a really great product. The side best for, for the mobile. mobile. So, so that really talk about the application market. Can you talk about applications? The, the, because developers are really part of the big conversation right now. You guys are racing out with solutions out there uh, with customers and you're providing a, a service. The, the role of the developer, agile programming, these are like consumer-like concepts, but now the enterprise needs to up their application portfolio, so we've seen the trend of app stores. Um, the app conversation is, hasn't always been the leading conversation in with IT uh, in the data center. How has that changed, uh, or is it still early, the role of the application developer? Well, I, I think if you start developing application today, most likely then, then then you want to make it cloudable in a way. What does it really mean? It, it is, it is I, I, I'm not sure if it's, I think again the cloud, if you think about the cloud really as a, as a kind of flexible layer and provisioning layer, it is about the technology, the portability for example. So I suppose all those things are the, because in the past you were, it was easy, you focused, you have a certain hardware, certain kind of a middleware, certain kind of operating system, so on, so you build so your software, .NET or Java, whatever, that's your choice, and then you just do it. And now, I think, but, but I, I'm not sure if it's really so big thing for the software development, because you sh should be able to somehow, as far as I understand, I'm, I'm, I'm not a technician, but somehow, what you call it, encapsulate or whatever, so that it really is portable from one yeah. place to the other. And I would imagine that your, the development tools that you are using today, they would kind of do the encapsulation for you in a way that it, when you work on those perimeters that they give you, then, then it is movable. But I, I, I yeah, We're think seeing that platform as a service, for example, yeah. becoming a key enabler for developers because they can abstract but that's away. That's also interesting. Where, where is the limit between the platform as a service or software as a service? If you are providing for that's example- That's a good question. Where is it? it? it well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, basically, Platform, if you only think that it's kind of a middleware and maybe some kind of a management layer on top of it, that's clear. But then when you go to database, you go for example the messaging services, or you go, you could call, I, I think you can call it a software as a service or application as a service as well as platform as a service. So it, I, I don't know what is a platform, what is an application, it's a good question. And you know, there's also infrastructure as a service. So, you know, we've been saying in Silicon Valley. Which angle, is the most difficult part, by the way, in many ways. Yeah, I mean, as you go down to the infrastructure, there are things with virtualization, and now network virtualization is very, very difficult. Configuration management, automation, this is not trivial. Yeah. So, up the stack, they look down and looks, it has to be turnkey. Um, and that's a problem, problem today in some of the tech that I'm seeing. But again, what is the line between commodity, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service? And the, the fundamental question that everyone's asking th th in the market today is what's the differentiation strategy for a vendor, a provider? At, if platform as a service and software as a service and is erased to zero, which some say, 
it gets commoditized, where's the differentiation? Um, we think it's in software and services. It is. So can I, you I agree. share your I thoughts on that? Well, I, I think just just a, a little bit background. We started our infrastructure as a service offerings about two, two and a half years ago. And I, I think we made a mistake because we basically thought that it's, it is a building block you need. And then you put your platform on top of it, then you put your application on top of it. But then we also thought that we can sell it as it is because people would need testing or development. It, it hasn't been at all as easy as we thought because then you have all the security, the network connections, all the things that we've been discussing on also about here. And we didn't really probably, and many people haven't really thought about those. You just, it's so easy to build your infrastructure stack and then, okay, just plug it in. Well, it didn't work so easily. So I, I think, and then because why? Of, because of the dynamic nature of what? The apps and the network or all the above? I think the, the accessibility, the kind of two, twofold. It basically, it's all about the security and the access. So on the other hand, the, the kind of front-end access for the end users, and then the back-end access for those who are maintaining the system. And basically, the traditionally, when we built our IT system, we'd made our best, all the efforts to make sure that those are, those are totally separate. But they can't in the cloud way be. So I, I think the thinking that, that what you have as your basic infrastructure and all the kind of rules for, for accessibility, they would work for cloud as well. It's probably not. It's not that simple. So, and how are you helping? Um, how are you working with with people in the in, in the in your customer base solve the cloud problem? What specific use cases are you see as the most prominent right now? I think for us, for the large what, what enterprise, comes, what, what comes to the cost for the large enterprise? I think for us, one of the big big things lately has been the kind of road from system service management, integration, aggregation, and fa then finally to the service orchestration, because. People have always had difficulties of managing, especially if you have multi-tower services, you're buying services from different partners. It doesn't even have to be IT services, it can be anything. Managing and orchestrating all those services is always, it's always been a pain. In, uh, yeah, well, and in cost too. Yeah, it's, and a cost as well. Yeah. And actually also a cost that you don't really manage well. You don't even know exactly what you are spending with those. So what we see now coming, and, and we already have quite a few clients where we basically are just doing the service orchestration or integration part. So we can take all the SLAs from all existing service providers, for example. We take the SLAs, we carry the risk for the SLAs, and then we use our expertise to manage all those different towers. And you assemble the SLAs in concert with what the business objectives exactly. are. Exactly. And match that to the infrastructure. Exactly, so then the client has one Portal. One kind of a portal or one kind of window. A, yes, one, one kind so of. So you guys are providing a management function as well as an interface, yeah. both yeah. technology wise and. Yes. And when you say take that risk of the SLA, you're actually taking the business risk on? Yes. Or yes. management risk or both? Well, I mean, business risk, management risk, uh, what do you do? But basically, yeah. the SLAs are supposed to. They are supposed to be there to support <laughs> your business as well. Uh, well theoretically, your yeah. SLAs are there that if you breach, you have a business problem. If you don't breach, your business is running. Well, you're hitting on my favorite topic, which is the business, uh, the data center operating system. Because yeah. what you're basically mm -hmm. doing is assembling at runtime the different service levels within an enterprise True. and managing that for the client. Mm -hmm. so that's essentially creating an operating environment for the customer yes. and providing that as a service. Um, so it kind of makes sense. Um, so with that, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the concept of a data center operating system where you know, HP and others are putting out some really good uh, R&D and made through HP Labs, a holistic approach to the data center. They're looking at using big data, using management software, uh, specifically one of the hottest things that we're tracking right now is DCIM, mm -hmm. data center integrated services management type software mm -hmm. that works across the data center. Have you, are you seeing any of that uh, in your environments now or is it still too early R&D? Well, I, yes, I see, but I, at least for us, I, I think that's where there was a discussion, I don't know if you were, there was one panel just, just, just before the lunch time, actually, and there was a discussion about the lock, lock in actually, a kind of a technical lock in And I think that's where the, it's quite obvious that if you go, the kind of a higher level of services you go take for your data centers from one given provider, the more difficult it is actually to break away from it. So I, I don't know if that, so the that, nestedness that world is ready. Yeah. The nestedness of one vendor providing or one technology. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's like I, I think it's a kind of the same thing. We discussed about the virtualization already for quite a few years. <coughs> and then we also, I, I did a lot of work with the virtualization of different layers. Also, for example, virtualization of the stories. And, and then there, there was a, that there is a software provider 
for my, I can buy a product that then I can plug in all my all my stories or whatever beneath it. Yeah, it sounds good, but the problem is that then I have a complete lock in with that virtualization software. I can't change that part ever. And the same if you take it kind of the abstract way a little bit higher to the data center level, then it could be the same. But I, I don't I, I don't really know about it. So. Okay, so the change gears I want to ask you around, I'll talk about globalization. So I talk to a lot of my friends and, and some of the, them run huge global operations. And so it's a complicated environment. You have all kinds of issues around replication of data. You also have policy issues around country management, and country rules. Um, cloud has been an interesting use case where um, cloud can be an enabler for business logic and business use cases around um, country deployments people who have data centers in all over the world who were managing, whether it's a follow the sun sort of, you know, backup strategy or application follow strategy. The moon, follow the moon, <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, depending upon that. So, so how does cloud enable a global business? Um, take advantage of some of the resources when you have, in some cases, regulation in countries. Have you, because you have a, you're operating a global operation. Yeah. Can you lend some insight into uh, the global CIO out there who's grappling with in-country strategy. Should I put a data center in Africa? What do I need to do in India? Um, should I look at tier two cities? Follow the sun, all of the above. What's on the agenda for these global CIOs and how they use cloud to, to architect their data centers? It's a big question, but let me- It is a big question. I was just trying to think that what's, but I think one thing is, is first of all, we discussed it also that we, People may think that there is easy in a way the cloud world that you basically have need to have big enough theaters in all the time zones and then you just manage and you, you follow the sun or you follow the moon and so on. But then you, you especially well coming from Europe, you start thinking about okay, we have about tens of countries with very strict regulations, so all the data have to stay inside the country borders. No matter, uh, well, you can move it maybe from Finland to Sweden or so on, but not not much further than that. And, and that complicates it. So I, actually, I think now we are kind of rethinking it probably needs to be much more granular than we thought. We also, like many people, you remember some years ago, yeah. many people thought that all the Googles of the world, they were building huge data centers here and there. But I, I don't think that it's really going to work that way. Unless you get to the PaaS or even SaaS level, when, when, you, when you kind of, for them, it's actually easier. Because by default, they if you're going, if you're going to traffic. Azure, if you're going to Amazon, they won't, by default, they won't promise you that they will store your data in your own country or whatever. And you, you accept it because it's part of the concept. And then if you buy your services, it's more. But then about the global things is that, that uh, companies that are truly global, they, don't, they actually are, in a way, the easiest clients because they don't typically care. So they are okay so that, okay, I am truly a global company. I'm fine that all my data in Europe is centralized in Germany, all my data in APAC is centralized in, in, in Singapore, and all my data in, in, in here is in centralized in New York or whatever. So that's okay with So them. they're already operating at that level. Yes. So the yes. wannabe globals exactly. have to figure out their localization strategy by data. Yes, and also the kind of, because typically, if, do you really have global operations, or do you have only sales depots, I mean, all around the world, and so on, so it really depends. Okay, so my final question here in this uh, CUBE conversation here at the Intel Forecast 2012 is, um, what's the impact that you see in the next few years in the services area? Um, what are the big in, uh, things that's going to really change the equation, if you will, and change the distribution of wealth and, and uh, the ability to monetize that will impact the business? You know, we had a theme, adapt or die, you know, transform or die. It's been a mantra that's been around for all innovation cycles. But as we enter in this new age of big data, cloud, and, and all this innovation, apps and applications, mobile, social, what is <coughs> going to be the disruption areas in the services business? And, and services being, you know, how people are servicing their customers, how they're acquiring, delivering services. What do you see as the, from your personal perspective, the key disruptions in that market? Well, that was a, that was a Next few years, what are you what are you expecting to <coughs> what are you watching? What trends are you watching closely that you're still not sure about that could really transform the business completely or not? It's still open 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 ended for you. I don't know. I mean it's 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 like like well it's it's, it's stupid to say because it's sort of, but I mean it's it's like always. It's uh, you kind of overestimate 
the next one or two years and then you underestimate what's going to happen in five or ten years. <laughs> so I, I suppose that's why it's quite a bit difficult as well. I do feel though that people people say that the, the cloud is kind of the next paradigm change after the internet. Fine, it can be so. But I mean, I, I feel that in a certain way, the cloud is still so kind of uh, small and granular. It's, it's all over the place. It's like a, I don't know what you say it in English, kind of a dusting phase. So yeah. everything is in the air. Yeah, flying around. And, and finally, you let them, you settle. let them come let the down and settle. they will settle in a way or the other. There will be a certain kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there is one thing that is quite clear, that there is room for People like us, I mean, big service providers, we have to be able to, to provide more agile services. That's quite clear. That's what we are focusing on. Our main focus still will be with really big enterprises and, 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 and all that helping them to orchestrate and manage their services. Because as we discussed, the role of the CIO becomes more like a chief service orchestrator, and that's where we want to go and help them. So I think for us, the clear to me it's quite clear we go and from that system management traditional we go towards the orchestration yeah. play but then there is a, what it really means is that because now having an IT system having a system even for a small company of one or two persons it is easy it's cheap it's, it's you, you can do it so there is going to be a lot of room for kind of a much smaller innovators niche kind of uh, players boutique but kind exactly of. but where do they exactly settle in they are not going to really compete with us because they have the different kind of a client yeah, sector. The the well, Hetri, thank you so much for jumping inside the cube. Um, this is Cube thank Conversations you. from uh, Intel 2012 forecast event in New York City. We'll be right back with our next guest.